nice to meet you. Where, where are you located? I'm in Austin, Texas. Okay, the new capital of the world. <laughs> it pretty much is. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and being in music, I mean, that's the place to be, isn't it? It really is. It's like music called me home really when I moved here. So um, I've always been an artist myself and, a, and an entertainer just back in North Dakota. You know, it was just gigs and events and opportunities were just so far and few between. Yeah. Well, that has to be some level of culture shock coming from a place like North Dakota down to Austin. Very much. It was, um, you know, for the best. I'd say, but yeah, a lot of uh, the first year, there was some rough and tumble, of course, and, you know, navigating and figuring things out. But um, most people here are really, really friendly because a lot of people are transients or they're transplants from other places. And so they're really open minded to uh, meeting friends. And so um, my experience has been uh, very positive. Good deal. Well, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. So again, it's great to meet you. And I'd love to begin our journey into your work and and what you're doing right now by asking, you know, four years ago, this pandemic really did its thing on all of us. And it really did kind of bring Austin to the forefront. People started migrating and things were changing. How did you make it through that time period? And how did it change the way that you do things now? Oh, that is a great question. So, you know, the funny thing is I actually... Um, during the pandemic in the later part of 2020 and early 2021, um, my then partner and I actually purchased purchased an RV, uh, like a lot of people were doing at that time. We had that opportunity, and we uh, skipped a winter of North Dakota and uh, went down to Austin and lived in Austin. And uh, during that time, uh, for four months, so we were here. We uh, I got to get involved with the community and kind of explore the city somewhat, you know, it, um, it was, it was nice. It was great to be able to be outside in the winter, uh, in North Dakota, it's very challenging to be outside in those cold <laughs> yeah. months. Yeah. But, um, I would say it opened some doors for me. Uh, the pandemic was challenging, but it also presented opportunities to work from home. I was in corporate, so I was able to work from the RV and I got that approved and so I was able to explore the city. We were able to make that move down south. So, you know, on paper, you know, you're a speaker, you're a community builder, you're a, a music super connector. But if I was to put you in front of a bunch of third grade students at career day and one of the kids says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? That's a really fun question. I would say I am the. I'm the party planner. There you go. I'm the they party planner. That. <laughs> yeah, they would totally. You would be their favorite person. They'd be like, "We want that party planner back to talk to us again." <laughs> we would have a party with yeah. those third graders. It'd be a blast. <laughs> so let me ask you this: What did you want to be in the third grade? What was your dream? I actually wanted to be an entertainer. Okay. I wanted to be in music and um, acting. So how did we get here? Take me back to your beginnings. And it was it North Dakota. Is that where you were born and raised? Take me from there, and what were the early seeds that were planted into you to love music, to love entertainment, and to eventually evolve into this role you have today? Yes, and so I started my journey. Um, I was from the age of like three. I was walking, and when I first was walking and talking, I was singing and dancing, and I was a natural performer. And I got into plays. My, you know, being from North Dakota, there wasn't a huge amount of opportunities, but the ones that did come up, my parents were very supportive. My mom was really encouraging to me to get into things and and do school plays throughout my youth into my high school years and then also do some things into college and after college with um, both uh, the both the acting as well as the singing so you know music and and entertainment was kind of my my escape um, when I was very young like at, at five you know I went into school with this big bubbly personality so full of energy and it wasn't as well received <laughs> Uh, so I ended up going through a lot of um, hard times, you know, being bullied, you know, I was different. I, you know, teachers didn't know what to do with me. I didn't know how to react or respond. I was, you know, so young. And so I went through a lot and it was music and creativity across like the arts in general that really helped me get through those times and build friendships along the way. So what was the first live concert that you saw that blew you away that made you think that's what you want to do? 
Well, the first live concert I saw that just like had me floored was in sync. I did. Okay. I saw in sync and, you know, I just really loved seeing the production. And at that time I was only, I think I was 12 or 13 when I saw in sync. So I wasn't really thinking that much into it, but I mean, from my first actual show that made me think deeper about it was when I saw Odessa just a couple of years ago in Minneapolis. I had never ex been exposed to the show like that. And it moved me. At that time, I didn't know what that meant, but it moved me to have the emotional release and response to such a beautiful production. It just yeah. really had my mind going. So it's one thing to have this dream of being the ultimate party planner and to get into music, but it's another to begin that journey. What was the first step for you where you were like, this makes sense, it actually worked, and it went on from there? Yes. Yeah, so back in, back in Fargo, North Dakota is actually where it happened. I was always in the creative scene, the community building scene, and I had connected with a DJ. And we were talking about create, creative like things, and I was a dancer. So I was doing um, shuffle dancing, which is a popular dance form in the electronic music space. It's a lot of fancy footwork. Take like Michael Jackson meets LFMAO and you got some shuffle dancing and you just, it's really, really fun, high energy. And so I was practicing that actually during the pandemic and even prior to that. And so I, uh, I threw him an idea and this was like a month before I moved to Austin. So it was one of those like, hey, I'm here for a month. Let's do something cool. And he's, he's like, yeah, let's try it. And we uh, we were at one of the local bars where he was playing usually every weekend. And for that month, at least one day a weekend, I shuffled and I danced and I hype danced. We had that bar crazy going. They they were having so much fun. Everybody was engaged. People were along the rails, dancing, following my moves. Like I made so many friends. And I was, uh, they even, the, the house let me dance on a table, which is not usually allowed, but they wanted to elevate that. And at the end of the month, the house asked me, they're like, we'd love to hire you on as a hype dancer. And this is something that Fargo, North Dakota or North Dakota in general didn't do. They didn't have that. And I said, I really am truly honored. Thank you for that like compliment that this was entertaining. This was engaging. I, and I let them know I was moving. But that experience is really what was the catalyst to the beginning of everything. So the music industry is really tough, as we all know. I mean, it's it's it can be a brutal place. And being somebody that is so enthusiastic and, and going through it, you're in the epicenter of things in Austin. What has been the thing that's been the most hopeful for you about being in this business? The thing that is most hopeful for me is the people, the community, the, the artists that I work with, the the effort that they put in the talent that I see every day and work with every day and the kindness that I see, that's really what motivates me. You know, the people I work with are, are, you know, we do a vibe check. Like it's a, it's a, we, you know, make sure we're a team effort. We're creating out of love, you know, we're creating out of, out of these, like out of the beauty and the love of the music and the art. And that's what I think that drives me, you know, keep the magic alive, you know, remember why you love it. And it gets you through the hard times of the industry. And I've been through some even in this, this first year, it's not easy. But if you love it, and you remember that love for it, and surround yourself with other people who have like minded thoughts, um, that can really get you far. So who's been a hero for you? Who's been an inspiration for you in your work? Oh, my goodness, Prince, Prince all the way. All right. Uh, Hails from Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, which is, you know, very close to Fargo. And yeah. just what he did in music was so impactful. And uh, it wasn't until like I was in my later 20s that I realized how much like Prince did and how he shaped music as it is today. You know, I remember interviewing a band that was going to Oklahoma. They were going somewhere. And I said something about Prince. And they all like, it was like a pin dropped. And I was like, I'm never going to tell anybody about a celebrity death any ever. I just won't do it. Even if I know, and I've just looked at it, I'm with somebody, it would be topical. That Prince thing was the creepiest thing that I ever went through. And I vowed it off. So <laughs> of all the good things that Prince has done for me, that's another good thing that he's done. Did you ever see him live? 
I didn't. I wish I would have. There were opportunities to do it, and I never went. I there were so many times like he threw these pajama parties, and I was listening to a local radio station ninety. Um, I think it was ninety three point or ninety eight point three, the current out of Minneapolis, and they got all the underground stuff, and they would always promote his stuff. I didn't, but I have a good friend of mine. Uh, she was a dancer for him back in the like in the eighties wow. and nineties. Yeah, so she has so many stories. Wow. The, he came through Kansas City and there was a place called Kemper Arena and it was down kind of in what we call the bottoms. And there was a really cool blues club called the Grand Emporium. And after that show, he went up and it was a surprise. And they said, anybody that's here right now, we're selling tickets. And then they closed the doors and he had a private show there. And mm -hmm. I heard from people that said it was just crazy. Like he played like a three, three and a half hour set down at Kemper and then came mm -hmm. up and did a couple more hours. It was just like fueled on adrenaline. That was Prince, Energizer yeah. Bunny. I, I wish I would have went to his shows. That's one I do regret. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this. If you can meet anybody alive right now, whether it's in the music industry or otherwise, that you find fascinating, who would you love to hang out with and, and see how they work? That is a great question. I guess for me, man, that's, a, that's tough. It would have to be... Gosh, I would love, honestly, I'd love to pick Oprah's brain because um, as a, you know, entertainer and she truly embodies who she is. Yeah. And th that for me is someone who's been through the trenches and who's experienced being fired, being like from network and different things that she's went through and just her interviewing style too, you know, as a podcaster myself too, it's like something I would, like she just really embodies who she is. So she would be the dream guest. If you could have one guest, that would be the one. Uh, I guess for, for like, yeah, for a person to just to have grab, I would say like grab coffee with or like have pick her brain, but artists, dream artist would have to be, you know, honestly, Steve Bryan, Steve Bryan is a producer out of Germany. He does a uh, progressive house. And I actually am friends with him. And so I would love to have him on my show. He was one of the first people who inspired me to get into um, and into the love of electronic music. So what is it that motivates you every day to do this work? You obviously have to give a lot of yourself. It's not just a job you come in and check in and leave. You have to give a lot of yourself, but you have to hold some back to evolve as a human being yourself. What is that collective gumption for you every day? The collective gumption for me would be just seeing the artists that I know and love leveling up and thriving, seeing them push themselves to the next level. And also that is, you know, me, that's a reflection of what I want to see myself do as an artist as well, you know, to see talent grow and see potential being like tapped into that really motivates me. So of everything that you've done in your career up to this point, what was the one period that you grew the most? It may have been difficult, but there was success at the end of it. What was that time frame for you? That was, um, I would say early on when I started throwing the parties. Uh, that was October of last year's when we threw our first party. And I had about six months with the venue. And we had the opportunity to really grow there. It was a, a beautiful, I call it a stepping stone. It was a beautiful stepping stone. Uh, towards the end, though, things got really rocky. And that was um, presented a lot of struggles that I didn't feel was a good fit for my my brand, for my artists to have to endure. And so I had to make that executive decisions to exit working with that venue. And that was very challenging because I felt like I failed. You know, I felt like I was like, I didn't do enough. I didn't work hard enough. And I really had to look at the situation and say, it just wasn't the right fit anymore. And I can take the 99% of it that was beautiful and leave like, you know, there's that 1% that was slightly, that was challenging. It was really challenging at the end, but the beauty that came just surpasses it so much. And so I think that was a huge growth moment for me. So let's say you have a dream tonight. You run into like the 18-year-old version of you. You can give that younger version of you a piece of advice based on this life you've led, the wisdom you've gained. What advice would you impart? What would you tell your young version? Leave the men alone and just go for what you want in life. <laughs> you know, just stop worrying about impressing people. Stop worrying about having to find somebody that completes you. Think about yourself and what do you want out of life? Yeah. And you've got it. Don't forget about your talents.
So of everything that you've done and sacrificed and evolved into, what are you the proudest of? The proudest of is, I think, finding my own voice again as a as a vocalist, as that part of my career. And that's something I've been scared to to do for, I don't know why, just like a lot of fear around just sharing my voice again. It's been many years. However, that is one thing I'm doing now, working on a track. So I think that's going to be the major accomplishment because that track embodies um, the last year of my life, which had a lot of pain, a lot of things. And so these tracks, I want to showcase and and um, allow them for the listener to relate to them as a uh, as a way to heal, as a way to remember that they're worth it. You know, it's what you just described is a phenomenon that I've heard a lot about. When you're a singer, you're you're in the forefront. You make it look easy, and people think, "Oh, well, they were just born for it. That's what they do." But there's so many stories. Like the first time Ella Fitzgerald stepped onto the stage at the Apollo as this shy little kid. I mean, they were jeering and like, "What is this going to be?" And then this voice comes out, you know. And mm -hmm. I've always heard stories that like behind stage, and when she wasn't on stage, there was a level of social awkwardness that went into who she was. Mm -hmm. And and I've heard other singers that like big tumultuous events happen in their lives and they literally step away. It's kind of like a someone was describing it as like when you take a house plant out and you have to replant it, all of the roots have to have to get to a place where they've healed from being uprooted and put back in a new place. So how common is that from what you see and just being in this community? Is that a common phenomenon? I would definitely say that many artists do ebb and flow in their career. They they have to step back and like are, are, a lot of artists are feelers. They are they are highly emotional. They they feel deeply. That's why they create the way they do. And and for me, yes, it's you even think of like greats in like in other art forms like painting and things like they there is a an ebb and flow. There is a, a time to kind of rest and take a step back, take a sabbatical, do something, or just like your, your career changes. Like if you need to go and hustle and make money and get into corporate for a while, there are those things that artists are, are um, bouncing. I'd say bouncing kind of ebbing and flowing within their careers. And for me as well, I, I never would have considered even being a singer until I got to Austin. And I'm like, yeah. wow, there's opportunity here. So if you could get into a time machine and go back in time and see one performance by an artist, where, I think I know what your answer is, but where would you go? <laughs> I would go to Paisley Park for a pajama party with Prince. Wow. Yes, 100%. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So at the end of the day, with everything that you're doing, is kind of bringing the party in, being a singer, being a podcaster, everyone has a perception of you. There's all these different crowds of people, family, friends, everybody that consumes what you do. But at the end of the day, you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? That is a question I ask myself every single day because it's always evolving. Um, I want to be a, a connector for people. I want to be a voice. Using my voice is like that main thing, whether it be in podcasting or even communicating within my business. My voice is that my superpower. And our voices say, you know, we there's a lot of power in words. And I, I always want to make sure that I'm sharing words that provide value, you know, um, because our words, we could say one sentence to someone and if it resonates with them in some way that can affect the trajectory of their life. I've had it happen to me and I want to make sure I'm always giving my voice in a way that is encouraging, that is out of love. And that is, um, obviously real. There's real, there's pain. There's things that we go through, but always to have the underlying, like, you're going to get through this and you can do this. And so using my voice is definitely the thing for me. So if anyone wants to indulge, hire you, listen to your podcast, any of find out about your single, anything that's coming out, where's the best place to go? Definitely uh, amplifyedm.com. That is our website and hub for everything that we're working on, parties we're throwing. I'm actively building on it, and we're definitely building out the media side of it as well. You can also find me on Instagram at Cote is my personal. Give me a follow, and then at amplifyedm, uh, all one word. Uh, we're super easy to find, and you can uh, get connected with our podcast and our events. Excellent. Hey, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for your story. I appreciate it. And best of luck with all these endeavors. There's a lot going on.
Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Absolutely. Thank you.